Um, so there's all these companies, you know, you, you've worked with a bunch of amazing companies like Nike and the World Bank, General Motors, Mars. IBM in the United States just announced that they're hiring a thousand designers, not so much to just go and design stuff, but they're looking to bring creativity mm -hmm. into, the, into their workspace. I mean, this is one of the world's most stodgy companies, right, looking to shake things up. But um, do, do you feel that this emphasis on being innovative, thinking innovatively, even having a framework that you use to think innovatively, is this just something that's you know, a new fad? I mean, we've seen all kinds of fads. Or is this a fundamental shift in the way that we as people are looking to tackle problems, and in general, even on the, on the corporate level mm -hmm. as well? Back. Yeah, I think in my experience, there's a real range of what innovation means and design means to these different organizations. And um, for some, it is like a checkbox. I know we need to do innovation right now, so you know, let's bring in an innovation consultant or whatever it is. Um, but I think on a more fundamental level and with uh, some of the ones that are like IBM, I think, who are um, taking the lead in what innovation means to organizations and, frankly, to society <laughs> right now. I think it's an awareness of sort of moving from really defined problems to ambiguous ones. And, and innovation isn't only about, you know, how to, to develop the next widget, but how to make sense of whatever comes, whether it's a product development problem or an organization problem um, or problems we can't even foresee and can't even characterize right now. What are the, you use the word mindsets, what are the mindsets, what are the practices that we might develop through some of the obvious kinds of problems we have right now, but that will serve us in the increasingly complex, um, unpredictable, you know, multi-stakeholder kind of things that, that all these organizations are facing because, you know, the world is just changing at a much faster rate. And so I think, yeah, I think for, for them, it's an acknowledgement that, that change is the only thing that will stay the same, right? And that innovation, if they're really thinking about the most powerful way, is about, it's not a fad because it's about how do we keep up with whatever, whatever the next fad is, whatever the next need is. Um, you've worked with a bunch of companies and you've seen the inner workings. Uh, is there one that sticks out for you as, as sort of either being able to implement the best sum of these, um, you know, workspaces, principles, methodologies, whichever way you want to define them. Is there one that maybe was an unexpected surprise for you? I mean, the, the range of people you worked with from the World Bank to Mars Candy, <laughs> it's quite broad with very different products, very different people working within them, very different cultures. Um, so I'm just wondering from your experience if there's one that particularly sticks out and, and why. I mean, the one that I talk about the most recently is actually one that I haven't worked with as intimately because I've gotten to know them more since leaving IDEO and, and working more with their people um, and knowing their people and, and seeing what they do. Um, but I've been really impressed with um, Fidelity, which is their, their Fidelity Investments as, as a financial firm in the U.S. Um, financials services is not where you think of huge innovation. But what I've been really impressed with in seeing their work, um, they have an innovation group, also not necessarily unusual. Um, but what I've seen is that, and what impresses me so much, is that they're some of the smartest, most creative people I've met who are also very humble and not afraid to ask questions of themselves and of their process. Um, I've seen, just going into their cafeteria, I've seen them testing their own sort of research materials and things that they're going to go use um, so that they can iterate them and, and just really, like I've been talking about, sort of using this stuff at all different levels. Um, even in, in the way that I see them, you know, just offering a, an event for, for a client that I was working with that, that was coming there to visit, like understanding, taking the time to understand who are the people who are coming, 
listen to what they're interested in hearing about and be responsive about that. So just living and breathing this stuff at all different levels, I think has been really impressive. And then also um, embodying as their mission not to be the sole sort of location of innovation within the company as much as being an ambassador for it and supporting anyone who is trying to be innovative around the company. Hard in a big company, but this, the people in this, in this group are able to um, offer the support and coaching and not only to them, but everyone around them to help them be successful. So that's a group I've been really impressed with. Um, my last question, because I want to make sure we open it up to the audience. Um, it seems that innovation is by nature something very messy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just innovation, giving birth to any new idea or even coming up with a solution that is different, mm -hmm. um, let's say to all the last ones you've tried that failed, is in itself a very messy, very um, uh, challenging, difficult process. Um, and, and there's all these different attempts to try and institute order in the messiness. But it's striking to me that more and more people are looking to more creative disciplines mm -hmm. like design, like art, music, as sources of inspiration uh, you know, for solving these challenges. Why do you think that is? I think there's a couple of reasons. I think. So even just using the, the compass as an orientation to talk about it, because those are fundamentally making activities, making music, making art, um, you can't stay in a conceptual space very long and you don't make the same thing again and again because people will very quickly tire of your art or your music if you make the same thing again and again. Um, at least in, you know, when they look to music, they're usually looking to improvisational music, right? Um, so it's forcing, it's, it's, it forces people to move around that space perhaps very messily, right? But to move, where I would say that most organizations are kind of stuck. They're probably not really consciously moving in any of those directions. They're not really looking at their ob you know, observations. You know, the way like, a, and I would defer to you here actually about what an improvisational music, I am an improvisational musician, but at an amateur level, and you know me much more about this than I do, but being able to really listen and to you know, come up with a handful of principles that shape the music, but not so many that you're overwhelmed. And being able to come up with new ideas um, for new riffs that you haven't had before and, and, and trying them and seeing what happens. And in any order that makes sense, a lot of it is just sort of back and forth, feeling, understanding when you need to get big picture and when you just need to keep your hands dirty and keep playing. And so that agility, that force agility that the creative practices have, I think is one of them. I think it's the ability to use all of your senses, which the creative you know, spaces do as well. Most of us in offices have kind of forgotten because I, frankly, a cubicle will sit down, shut down anyone's senses. <laughs> they have none left, I think, after that kind of life. But it's sort of about being, bringing your whole self, uh, all of your senses, your intellect, but also your intuition. Um, those things are, are common practice as well. Um, and then finally, being post-disciplinary, I think, as well. People in the creative spaces don't see, I think, the boundaries that we tend to in the professional world, where, you know, if people are looking for ideas for, again, like an aviation problem, they're going to look in aviation. And, and there's silos of, of, of disciplines. I think in the creative world, I mean, anything goes, right? <laughs> you know, people are really mixing um, whatever creates a really powerful experience for them as an artist or for the people they're trying to create. There's I don't think nearly as many sort of boundaries. So that kind of boundarylessness. Yeah, and I, I think you brought up something really interesting about, you know, I'll speak about music that inherently it's very, it's both about personal expression, but it's very outcome driven. You know, at the end of the day, it's not um, something that stays in your head. I mean, you have to express it, people have to experience it. Um, but the process through which you're creating is at the same time um, reactive to what's happening around you. Um, it's personal, it's yeah. collaborative, but then you still need to produce something that has an end product that somebody, react, somebody responds to. So I think just a quick build on that, you know, I hinted at this earlier, but 
organizations tend to normally function with people as sort of robots. Like, you know, we are, we follow processes and we so we make results happen. And I think, uh, you know, we aren't machines, we aren't robots, and organizations are only as powerful as the people in them. And so these creative processes that um, honor and develop a person's inner intuition and, um, and creativity, and, and, and it can be messy, like trusting that it can be messy, as long as they're aware of this entire space, right? As long as they're accounting for it and they're really exploring it all, trusting that they can do it in whatever order they want, you know, but as long as they can tell a good story in the end of like, I noticed this and I think this is what's important and here I had more than one idea, you know, and, and here's well, what I tried. And it was really powerful. You know, my, my background is, I mean, even though I've been in business for 20 odd years, obviously I have, I have a, a jazz background and in many ways, the process of improvisation follows the compass map. Or, or, or workspace, if you in will. Some you know, way. You're, you're constantly observing what's happening. Um, there's principles, right? I mean, people don't just go and do whatever they want, whether that principle is called the key, right. which we're all playing in, or whether it's the original composition on top of which we're improvising. Mm -hmm. There is a framework, so there's a That's set right. of principles. There's ideas. Usually, somebody, if you ever observe a jazz group, somebody will throw an idea. Maybe it's a drummer that plays a lick. Mm -hmm. You know, or, uh, or maybe it's a guitarist or the saxophonist, and then people will build on that if the idea is good. Right, it's an experiment, that's yeah. Experimentation. yeah. And then you will find that if the experiment works, and, and these things work in harmony at the same time, right, because you're rapidly yeah. observing what's happening, then people will take that experiment and say, okay, this is, this is yeah. it, this is not what we're playing. Um, and I'm not trying to, the last thing I would ever want to do is to automate that or make it in any way rigid as much as to articulate it because we are human beings and language is the way through which and, and we communicate, you know, we grow and communicate and, and, and access things. So we can, if we're forgetting to do those things, language reminds us what's available to us without dictating what we do. Yeah. That, that's correct. I mean, yeah. and, and also um, to your point, I mean, everything in life is both, has to have, be both flexible and concrete, and, you know, right. at, at, at the same time. Um, because as people, we want to be expressive and we want to bring our own voice into any situation, right? I mean, we feel at home, if you will, when whatever we're doing expresses us. And whether mm -hmm. it's our job, right. whether it's the product our company is producing, um, whether it's whatever piece of music I'm playing, it needs to be something that expresses me. Um, but at the same time, you're functioning within boundaries, mm -hmm. right? Um, so finding that, that balance, I think this is, for me, this is why people are beginning to look at creative disciplines, mm -hmm. because creative people tend to have a mental mapping process or whatever you want That's to call right. it, that I think is something that most people can relate to because everybody's innately creative anyway. Um, but also, you know, people have been codifying in many ways the process of being creative for hundreds of years. So it's it's an easily accessible library, if you will. Yeah. Um, anyway, I want to make sure we open it up for for questions. I'd love to hear what you heard from from Ella. Please don't be shy. And I know people have started to peel off, but if you you still have your sticky notes. Another way of using them is to leave, for me, um, your observations, you know, or principles or ideas or experiments that you would offer to me about how to, to make this work even better. So don't leave without leaving me one of those, please. So let me make sure I understood your question. So you're saying, um, 
is it better to offer process to them that, that helps them be creative, but then by following a process, then they, it's kind of like being more robotic because you have to follow, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think this, the, a lot of processes are actually really, really, really wonderful um, and enable organizations to innovate at a, a certain level. Um, I think empowering, you know, sharing principles, and actually what this is in a, in a, to a great extent is sort of at the principles level of like, we believe these four things are imp important to explore and to constantly question and to constantly develop. Um, and you can, here's some processes that we know do that. Now use them in a way that you know, you is, is feeling right for you. And, is, and, and when this process is slowing you down, then you find some way to skip over it. When you feel like you need to slow down, you can do that too. So I think that, you know, all these things are great as long as what we realize is that organizations are only the people in them. And in the end, it's about empowering them as much as possible. And so helping them develop their own inner compass about um, the use of processes and how when they're being the most effective, to me, is that sort of balance of both worlds. So you, I mean, artists use tools, right? We all use tools, but a great artist, you know, to them, their instrument is an expression, right? It's, a, they, it's an expression, it's a way to explore things, and you own it, it doesn't own you. And I think that's, that's the biggest difference for me, and that's what I feel that, that's what I felt when I was teaching this stuff, when people are looking at me like, what's the next step that I have to do? I'm thinking, this, isn't, this doesn't feel like being a designer to me. <laughs> I don't know how, but this process I'm teaching people doesn't feel anything like what it was like to be a designer. So, you know, but then people are also playing with just teaching mindsets in a really broad way, which is great. I love that work too. But that's not quite it either. So it's, it's a crazy balance. Does any of that make sense? Yeah. Well, and and I, maybe to answer the question uh, from a music standpoint, you know, process or people, you know, what's best to have a great piece of music written on a piece of paper that you ask anybody to interpret, or to not have a great piece of music, but to bring a bunch of great musicians together and just kind of see what happens, right? If you're looking to be innovative, I would choose the second any time. Um, because they'll, they'll, they'll come up with something. They'll come up with something amazing. So for me, the process of picking people is even more important than the, the way that you define processes within an organization. And I think that, you know, the world's, the world's shifting. Like, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, if you will, in the Industrial Age, people were putting a lot of emphasis on processes. And I think a lot of even business school curricula have come out of that mm -hmm. school, right? I mean, right. Uh, the Sloan School of Management at MIT, Alfred Sloan is, you know, was the leader of General Motors. So the big questions of the day were, how do I impose order on a vast, vast organization? Today is a lot more about nimbleness and agility. So I think people tend to come first in cultivating these things, like, you know, people who are able to observe and exactly. are oriented are able to quickly experiment, are able to ideate, are even more important than you know, fundamental processes that you install. I'm not saying you, you don't have any. Well, and, the, those. and just a quick build, where did these processes come from? People, right? People who ask these questions. All of those processes are asking these questions. And you know, I was at IDEO when the method deck was put out. I mean, those 52 methods about how to look, ask, try, and learn from people I mean, those were ways that people had developed or borrowed from anthropology because they really wanted to know this, right? Like, we, when we weren't getting this, really understanding what was happening with people, what they do, say, think, and feel, you came up with a new method. And if talking wasn't working, you used a visual method. And if that wasn't working, you got up and moved around, right? Because you were so curious about this. And that's where processes come from, people who are really driven to span this space, to see things in new ways. And if the way they're doing it's not working, they develop a new one. And when it works for them, they articulate it and they share it with other people. And that's how they come from. And sometimes it's the leaders who are doing that because they have the most freedom. They're, able, they're allowed to ask questions that people at lower levels aren't able to. 
But back to the people thing is, well, what if your people can ask these questions? What if they're allowed to ask these? What if they're allowed to develop processes that work for them or work for your organization rather than bringing in, I mean, building on processes that are out there, but you know, the, you guys could be creating your own next process that's really awesome as well. That's where they came from, you know? And it's funny because organizations will pay millions of dollars in hiring outsiders to come and evaluate them and put processes in place. But what's funny is the reason why consultants come in is because you're effectively buying time for somebody to observe your organization. Right. If you, if you instill that in your organization. Yeah, you know, we have the permission, right? Yeah. I do had all kinds of permission that people inside didn't. <laughs> It's kind of sad, but it's true. Can I ask you a design question? Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of like you said, you know, it's very important to have a design question. Yeah. 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 But those four nouns, and I just said, explore those. Explore your question, probe, challenge, your observations, your principles, your ideas, your experiments. You could do something. If you only had the four verbs or any set of verbs that are out there, I know because typically design thinking in most processes use verbs. Those alone are actually pretty ambiguous. And actually, if you looked at, if you noticed the earlier versions had both, but sort of at a similar level, I'd still hear like, what, what goes here? What am I actually doing in this space? What am I trying to make? It'd come up all the time, even though, yeah, it just wasn't, you know, because we were, there was one verb and then maybe kind of a lot of nouns that are describing what we're creating, it was, it was fuzzy. And so quite frankly, like sheer experimentation. And it was amazing, it went from what are we doing to when I flip, it's, this is, seems like semantics, right? It was amazing, like people could pick it up and use it. People, and it was, that flip was one of the biggest changes. Um, some of the questions, in order to get to really short questions, have, are a little bit more open-ended and I'm, I'm working on maybe making a couple of these a little bit longer again to make them a little bit clearer. But the concrete, oh, as long as I've got a bunch of ideas that are like new, and I'm, I'm seeing the big picture, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to look for lots of ways it could happen, I'm gonna be fine, right? You can brainstorm, ideate, imagine, like insert any verb here, it doesn't matter. They're all great and every process uses its own. But if you come up with a bunch of great ideas that are not stuck in the details but are letting you dream a little bit, this is the dream bucket, right? We all need it. We need a space to have ideas that we're not committed to turning into experiments. Um, and, and the choice of the, ver the nouns was really important too. I used to use prototype here, but that can feel very mechanical to people. Like for us at IDEO, it was clear, you can prototype anything, but the world doesn't necessarily see it that way. And more importantly, it focuses on the thing, and people will spend all this time creating a prototype when it doesn't matter. What matters is the experiment behind it. What is the question that thing is trying to solve? What's the experiment you're gonna try with the prototype to answer your questions? because that's all that prototype exists to do, to answer the most critical questions you have. And so when people focus on the thing, the prototype, as opposed to the experiment, which fundamentally has a question to it, like what's my, what am I trying to find out? So it's been like a ridiculous amount of iteration. And if you see, there's, I mean, there's hundreds of versions of this thing. And it's so weird to spend all this energy on what is now, what about 20 words or something, or 30 words? But at the same time, you know, the glimmer of hope that it could actually be something that is really useful to people makes it worth spending a ridiculous amount of time tweaking words. That was a long answer. Yeah. If I was to zoom in on what um, the previous question was, um, if we're talking about the creative industry, mm -hmm. and we take the arts and design as two different things, which, which do interrelate, to a certain extent, but not mm -hmm. absolutely. Right. So would, would there be a change in how that's, how the verb would have happened? Because design is quite structured, mm -hmm. no matter how innovative you are, whereas the arts are, are not very structured. They're not. And innovation can still be. So I was just wondering, it's a good outline, obviously, and, and it has worked, but um, yeah, 
I'm not too sure about how it works in these two, because we are talking about the previous systems, which do vary. They are. Yeah, and it, this language looks a lot more like the design, even some of it engineering design or scientific method, right? I mean, I'd, I'd love to play this back to Japanos and, and sort of the area of work that I'm, I mean, this is all sort of fueled by my own. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So yeah. the question is, 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 yeah. is, uh, is this applicable in the creative space? Well, yeah, because that's the last area. It's it's it is. Well, you know, I think there is a um, cre creativity is not unstructured. I mean, there's a, there's a structure to being creative, and there's a discipline involved in being creative. And you know, I think our last speaker, you know, a couple of months ago, Eitan, talked a lot about the process of becoming creative, and. From the music standpoint, you know, you you have to. I, I mean, I like to tell my students all the time, like whether it's business or music, you have to learn. You have to practice your scales, <laughs> no matter what. You know, there's a process that you have to follow to that. That's actually fairly rigid. You know, like there there is a rigidity in creativity too. Um, so, in, in, in my opinion, um, and, and you know, Ella and I didn't have this conversation before this talk, but when I was observing the, 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 her presentation, it struck me how even in something as relatively or, or thoughtfully unstructured as jazz improvisation, for example, this process or this compass is still intuitively followed, you know, even on a very rapid basis. Like, I, I'll tell you, as somebody who's you know, has a degree in jazz and in improvisation, right? I mean, you are, no matter where you are, and no matter how lost you become in the music, you're still grounded in those principles, you know, you're, for example, right? So I do believe that there's a mistake sometimes in, a, in a thinking that the creative industries or the creative process that there is a lack of structure or there's a lack of process, but there is an element of it that back, it's actually almost in the extreme. Sure, I mean, but that's true for anything, right? I mean, well, to be to be yeah. innovative, like in, in in a in any setting. I mean, I'm in education now, right? And so I'm I'm aspiring to innovate within education, just like in my with my company. I you know I innovated within an industry, but there's always constraints. Yeah, I mean, innovation without constraints is just. I guess experimentation for the sake of it, but there needs to be an outcome. There needs to be something that you produce that's useful, but that is always within a framework. Of, whether it's a framework of a company, a framework of a market, a framework or constraints around a budget, or uh, I, I would actually argue that it's those very constraints around something that make us more innovative and more creative. With no constraints, I don't think you're creative or innovative. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into a long discussion of the differences between innovation and creativity. But that's kind of the way I, I, I see it. And, and it, quick, I it. oh. No, I just wanted to ask something for, for the sake of connecting the, the lectures of the Entrepreneurship Center. I think this very much creates to our, our previous uh, uh, guest, like Juan said, the people who were here, uh, for those who were not as very unfortunate that you missed it. But um, uh, I think our previous speaker was talking about structured chaos. And he was making the, the argument that um, uh, you're actually most creative, most efficient, most effective when you structure chaos. You're ineffective in utter chaos as you are ineffective when you're bounded by too many constraints. But it's actually when you manage to structure the chaos, he was saying that the, the best creative pieces um, can come about. And, and I think this is kind of what you're saying, Ellen, as well. I'd love to build on actually both of what you both said. I mean, one of the inspirations for this work has been things that I just experienced at IDEO. So IDEO was people, I have an engineering background, working with people with, from an art background. Industrial designers went to art school and they have an art degree. And actually a tough time was when we actually started articulating this process, clients really wanted to know what we're doing. We're getting a little more expensive, a little more famous. Things started to be structured more and there were some 
really tough moments, actually, because I was most close friends, actually, with the industrial designers, and they were, I mean, I can't, I mentioned this, I can't design, I can't draw until phase three, and I, I, just, I just have ideas, you know? Um, and those, those moments really stuck with me, and so that's one of the reasons that it's moved me from process towards compass, because they have a really powerful inner compass. And one of the things that articulating our creative, own creative process, and, and everybody has a different one, but having words for it that we can share and having space for it. I mentioned making space. It makes space for many different kind of ways of working. And the language is tricky, right? Because you're trying to find language that works a lot, across a lot of things. And this language has been the most general I've found so far. The processes that I, re I listed weren't really artistic ones yet. The work actually of the summer is two directions. One is working with systems thinking people and one is working with people in the creative spaces and trying to continue pushing to see if it still works in those spaces. Um, but actually helping to create the space for what we do as artists, in this case, like industrial designers even, was really important to me. So the space to be able to dream, I would argue that most designer, you know, artists can, can really just imagine very broadly. And it has a space, and there's a meaning for it, and there's a reason for it. A space to try things, right? They don't, they do, they just try, and they do in safe ways, right? Getting permission to try stuff. Um, and sometimes it's even this language that might make more sense, you know, might be more general than the actual nouns, right? But these questions, um, every designer I know walks around with a camera, you know, and many artists do too, and they observe the world all the time, and they have a notebook, and they're drawing, and, and, and so that's this, right? Being able to just be really present and just, I, that's something I've really noticed in, in artists. And maybe this language doesn't quite fit, but the feel of this space, I do think, and musicians too, right? Are just kind of listening to the world around them and, and themselves and their heart. Um, and the same thing sort of with principles is like a lot of great art, I think, is people expressing really powerful things that they're feeling matters in the world and having an awareness and a growing awareness of what that is and what you believe in and that you're trying to express through your work. You know, and some people are more this than others. Some people are really like, some artists are very, very grounded in, in powerful sort of principles. They're trying to communicate some less so. But, so some people are more or less in these spaces, but these spaces I think honor ones that are true in the creative space, even if they would never, like what I've often heard from artists is, I'm not really aware of when I'm in this space or that space. But, artic but articulating the sort of broad space that artists cover helps people who don't experience any of these things, I think, understand and experience them for themselves, and also helps to create the space. Even if initially you do it in a more ordered kind of way, and eventually, just like any other tool, just like any artist, right, you learn the tools, and then you become more facile, and you start to mix it up, and you get messy, and you have an observation, you know, and you're populating this very randomly, um, but it gives meaning to it. So I think the question about the language is one that I'm very curious about, and it's the reason I'm pushing it all the time, and I want to do these, these experiments this summer in some new spaces. But the feeling of the space, I think, is relating to some extent, even if it's more divided up. It just articulates it, I think, more than tries to overstructure it, is my hope. I think you ask a great question. Are we out of time? Nope. No, no, tell me, because what time do we start the workshop? Exactly 10 minutes ago, we should have ended. So okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we're eating into the break right now? <laughs> the break. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. If there's a burning question, we. Uh, yeah. Amadi, yeah. I guess I have a question regarding cost. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in this uh, like approach, okay, you can think about uh, principles. I think uh, uh, I can also mark said that uh, you know, if you don't like, like principles, don't worry about others. So, <laughs> It's something that many people think that they can change all the time. No problem. Ideas also could be very cheap, right? So everybody has ideas. But I mean, if you go to experiments and observations, uh, this could have a, a big cost uh, in, in order to do them. Now, then if you do jazz and you are a good musician, yes, you can observe what you know your colleagues are doing, and you can experiment, and you do this in real time. And if you are really good, the result is good. Now, yeah, but if you want to design a, a large experiment, uh, for instance, to see how something affects a big population, uh, this may have a huge cost, right? Or if you want to do uh, an observation uh, that uh, spans uh, many people, 
or a large time frame and so on. Again, you will need to collect a lot of data, to process a lot of data, so that you will capture out of this observation some key metrics. So, uh, you know, if I were to go to my boss and say, look, I have these ideas, we need to, we need to do this experiment and uh, to conduct this uh, observation, and by the way, this would cost, uh, I don't know, a few hundred thousand euros or dollars, and probably it would tend to go away. So, how do you, can you take this into account? I mean, the issue of cost, which has to do also with the issue of constraints, because unfortunately, uh, most of the time, a lot of people work in very constrained environments where they cannot really experiment, or where experiments are expensive. Yeah. I got a couple answers. Did you want to jump in or? I'll, I'll jump in really quickly yeah. and then you're the design thinker. So oh, go you, for it. You know, I know exactly how you're going to answer. Well, I, I think I do. But I mean, by having gone through, like we're, we're actually, um, within our college, we're working on an enormous project around redesigning the entire way that we approach preparing students for careers after they graduate, which in the United States, there is a bigger and bigger pressure on any higher education institution. As a matter of fact, the White House has released a scorecard of how well your graduates do 10 years after they graduate. And your federal funding will depend on that. So there's a lot of pressure. Um, and actually, in our situation, we, we're working with, with IDEO on this process. But it, you're, it, there is one assumption that I think it's easy to make, that an experiment needs to be expensive, you know, or that an experiment needs to be big, or that an experiment that affects a lot of people needs to also be something that's experimented on a big level. Well, n not really, you know, like if you are thoughtful about the way that you go about it, the idea is that you try to find, you know, quick, easy, fast, cheap ways to produce these experiments before you begin conducting them on a much higher level where you begin to spend, you know, real money. And in almost every situation that I find, I mean, even, even, even in, in, you know, in the example that you mentioned, Miles Davis used to say that notes are extremely expensive. Use them very wisely, <laughs> you know? So a good jazz musician doesn't spend notes unwisely. If your currency is notes, you don't experiment that freely. You still have constraints, you know? So, um, I would say that it's, it's important that from a mindset standpoint, we don't associate experimentation in areas that affect a lot of people with necessarily something that needs to be very expensive or something that needs to be done on a big scale. But I'm curious about your, your yeah. answer. Well, two thoughts. Um, one is, and people in the workshop will see, the only other piece of content that I offer with this is a short mnemonic, you move, you use it for everything, and map as you go, oh, own this and orient yourself. Um, v, visually, verbally, and physically explore it. E, embrace everyone and everything that can be part of the system. And there's an exclamation point at the end, which is a cheat for an I, which is iterate. And so, first of all, you, you don't start with a big experiment. <laughs> you start with small experiments, just like a scientist, right? Like they don't ask for the giant funding before they probably tried some little things to see if this is gonna work, right? Um, and so it's very much an iterative process because that way you're, you're putting risk where it belongs. Um, well, by the time you get to the big, big things, you know, you've tried it in a small population. If you haven't, Lord knows you should not be asking for money to be doing it with the big one. Like, the heck, they should say no. Um, and, and the weird thing is actually in the social sector that I do a lot of work, that is not how funding works. They're expecting big experiments. They're expecting you to know what the answers are going to be when you're asking for funding, and it's very broken. And they know that social sector funding in the US is, is having to reinvent itself because what everything we know about entrepreneurship and innovation does not work with the way that ventures are funded in the social, or innovation is trying to be funded in the social sector. The other piece, I said this in passing, is that I believe that creativity, people, you know, they always want me to sort of put creativity here, like if I label, the attributes is each of these spaces, and I refuse to do that because I think that creativity lives in all of these. Great scientists are very creative about how to, how to generate new observations, how to look at things, right? How to tweak the system in some small way that will answer questions. 
um, how to look at the you know ways to model and look at the big picture. Of course, coming up with lots of ideas, but also here. And this is actually so my superpowers in this space are well, I'm kind of a bunch of these, but it's here and here, I love designing experiments because you know the phrase, if I had more time, I'd write a shorter letter. Well, you can do anything with a lot of money and a lot of time. What's creative is doing it with less, right? And so um, if you think, you know, to be concrete, you know, you think, it's, let's say it's an organizational change you want to make. Um, you know, how can you you definitely don't want to experiment big on that, right? You want to find some small, small way of doing it. You want to find some small, cheap way of doing it. And the thing is, it's not just for the purpose of experimentation. That challenge on yourself might actually change your idea. Because what if you can actually, you know, it's easy to come up with an idea that's really expensive. But if you're in your experiment, you actually can have, you try on a small scale and you have a huge impact by doing something that is free because that's all you have. All I can experiment is something free. You have to come up with an idea that works. You know, it forces you to come up with ideas that, that actually might have a lot of impact with very little investment. It's, you know, it's the, the high investment, high impact space is not that hard, right? There's always solutions out there. If it was easy to come up with things that are high impact, low investment, we would have more answers there. This is why you get paid the big bucks by your company, right? You need to find those. And so I think they're right in saying you have to experiment small at first. And that's the challenge of coming up with something that, that will have you know, a lot of impact, whether it's here or here. How do you do it with less? Um, and the best thing is when you find out that that experiment works a lot better than you thought. And you don't actually have to go to that big expensive idea that you thought you needed. You thought this was a stepping stone, but actually, in many ways, it already works. And you don't have to do all these big complex things. It forces you to get really lean. And I think that's great. That's really fun. Oh, Are we on time? We'll, we'll try to be quick, yes. I think the key take out from this is just being flexible. You had a circle going around, yeah. it's constantly floating around. It's being flexible and constantly analyzing. Mm -hmm. And even if you reach the experiment and you find your conclusion, you might cause a French Revolution kind of thing. So you end up with a new system that kind of defeats the whole purpose of doing it. So you've got to keep it uh, real yeah, it and just constantly bomb it, constantly do this experiment, even if you found the solution. That's the key take out. It's a space that I think innovators are constantly aware of. They're constantly observing, and they might notice that solution that worked. I mean, especially today, right? The world communities, at any scale, we are changing so fast that that great idea, like, whew, that worked, I'm done. That might last a week, you know? And if you want to stay on top of it, you have to have, you know, your radar on all these things. And I actually forgot the second thing that I was gonna say about this. One was to iterate. The other is, I feel really powerfully that um, for organizations, all their people, and I mean the people who clean the floors, all their people are their eyes and their ears, and they're their hands as well, and so, if you think about that, um, you know, all these people who are out there in the world, you know, they leave the workplace and they're out there in the world, they, they can be picking up on observations about what's happening in the world around them and, and trends and things like that, if you let them, if you let them be the sensors of your organization. And they can try your experiments. They'll be a hell of a lot more invested, pardon my French, in your, in, in your organization, if they're part of those experiments, ask them to. I mean, IDEO does it all the time. We used to pay a lot of money to recruiters to find the people we needed to do observations in our projects, and then we started like using friends and family and having people help find them, and people love doing it. So um, one way to do the you know, observations and experiments cheaper, but also to, to, to consider you know, your organization as a living organism that is constantly developing new, you know, a portfolio of all these things is to use everybody and to enable them to add, you know, their observations and, and to try things out in the world and be empowered to do that in a flexible way. Okay, last question. Can you think of an example in your uh, experience? We are implementing this model in Pakistan here. Can you buy it? Say one can, more time. Can you think of an example where, uh, Applying this model led to a bad idea. Oh. <laughs> I mean. It's a bad idea, not led to a bad idea. It's a bad idea. 
but when it's bad to use this. Oh. What? Wait. wait an example of when. Yeah. Well, that's a bad idea. Like uh, using it. Implementation of this model would be a bad idea. <laughs> I'm sure there are. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not going for 100 percent, right? I mean, I think like any other tool, it may not fit everywhere. Um, but yeah. But what, what's that? In my experience, you know, honestly, in my experience, I mean, I think. Um, you know, especially, and I haven't done a lot of talking about this, but um, I think that only when it's, you know, I think it's more in how it's implemented, if it's in interrupting your sort of natural flow, and if you're, if you're naturally, like, being very human-centered, you know, just the power of putting people in the center is just so, so powerful like it's very when when could you say it's not important to think about the people that matter and when is it not important to be aware you know so in in one sense these things are all really important but if you're actually already doing them for example and and it makes you question that or, or sort of stops your flow perhaps it's not a good time um, I mean again it's meant to be a compass and not a process so I think it's more in how I can imagine lots of ways it could be applied that could be a really bad idea like like forcing people to march through it in a process. Um, but if it's not, uh, if not that, then, well, I don't know. I, I continue to re experiment relentlessly. I haven't seen anyone, you know, I'm getting a lot of feedback from people. I've never had to say, oh my God, it broke me. And like, you know, you will have bad ideas as part of this process, but you will, you will experiment, hopefully in small, safe ways and, and address them. So it, it's, I don't know. That was a very messy way of saying, Probably, I haven't found them, I hope to, because then I'll make it better, you know? I mean, I've, I've given you a lot of failure modes, right, that have happened along the way. Um, and so I think, yeah, if it, any situation in which it's actually reducing someone's creative potential is bad. Yeah. I'm sorry? What about robotics? when I was doing robotics? Yeah, I mean, I think engineering design processes follow this very, pretty closely. And so that's what I learned and did at MIT. I didn't realize it at the time. I wouldn't have called it necessarily that. Um, but a lot of, you know, a lot of this, I mean, certainly I think it was more in the, a lot of the tinkering kind of stage as, I, as, a, as a roboticist, personally. Um, I didn't it develop, you know, I think IDEO taught me to, explore ideas more broadly than MIT did, which is a little bit more of a linear kind of place. <laughs> um, so I developed since those early days, 20 years ago, you know, but yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, what time are we starting the workshop? In five minutes? <laughs>